All right, so here we go. Uh, this is a bit of an introductory talk on the nature of religion, understanding religion. Uh, that's what I want to talk about here, trying to describe and elaborate what it all is about and what it consists of. So first off, I just want to highlight uh, the universality of religion. This is something we often don't think about, is how truly universal religion is and always has been. No matter as far back in time as we can go, there's been always evidence of religion in terms of where we humans have existed. The very beginnings of the human species, we've got evidence of religion. And no matter where on this planet we go in terms of space, there's evidence of religion. Every human society, where every humans have existed, they've always expressed some form of religious engagement. Engagement. And so that's most interesting. Why is it so universal? What is the basis for this universality? Well, I would argue it's rooted in human experience. That the very essence of religion is something experiential uh, at stake here. And so we're going to be covering three things. First of all, the essence of religion, understanding it. And then uh, the second part, I've called it what the goal and purpose of religion. And then the third part is the structure of religion. Okay. And through this, we'll kind of understand what religion is all about. So how about, how do we go about defining religion? It's really difficult to do that because there's a lot involved with religion. It's not easy to put it into a one sentence, uh, you know, a simple one sentence statement. statement. It uh, encompasses so many things. So what I want to highlight here in terms of uh, understanding religion is really get clear that religion is dealing with a very distinct subject matter. That is really the heart of it. So often people think religion is, well, a certain belief system or a certain set of practices like rituals. Well, a lot of things encompass belief systems and maybe entail rituals in terms of regular practices. You know, you can have a philosophy or a political system where it's a certain belief, certain practices, certain values, uh, laws, things that you think are right or wrong, uh, standards that you would live by, uh, your sense of identity with a social group. You know, there are many things that can have those features, but they're not religions. And so what is it that makes a religion a religion that sets it apart from a mere philosophy of life or some kind of human system of practice and belief? Okay, it is its subject matter, the kind of stuff religion deals with. That is the key. And what is the subject matter? I like to use the term trans-empirical realities. Okay? Religions have been about saying that there is something more to reality, to life, than just this physical world. That there is a reality that transcends this empirical world. Okay, it transcends this empirical world. That's what I mean by trans-empirical. And people across time and space have experienced in various ways that there are basically these components. Non-material forces and energies non-material beings or intelligences of some kind, uh, non-material places that people journey to, you know, places of other dimensions. And some humans also display non-ordinary, extraordinary states of being. And we'll kind of go through this, because this is the heart of religion, is these kinds of experiences. Excuse me. So first of all, trans-empirical forces. People experience that there are these unseen forces or energies that can exist. And they can be either located in a place or around objects or exude from certain people. Okay. And that these energies and forces can be either good or bad. They either can bring healing and blessing, and that's a positive energy, or they can bring harm and destruction, and there's like a cursing kind of energy, okay? And so, you know, we'll find this. So let's say you'll go into a certain place, and all of a sudden you'll just, oh, you get the creeps, and it's kind of, you feel edgy and uneasy, and you just get a bad feeling. It's got a bad vibe, okay? And that there's something dangerous, something evil, something dark, and you just feel like you want to get out of there, right? It's got a negative, heavy, just a bad energy about it. And places are like that. 
people experience this. Then on the other hand, you could get a place where it's like, oh, it's the opposite. It just feels so good to be there. You just feel more at peace, relaxed. Uh, there's like a flow of energy that seems to be healing. Uh, it's more, it's easier to pray or meditate and, and connect spiritually in this place. And people have those experiences. And that's then where people will build altars in a place where they have such a good feel about it and that then will beginning be the beginnings of a holy place they'll build an altar and then a shrine and then a temple right and then people will go on pilgrimage there and it develops a reputation for being a very holy place that this is where your prayers get answered this is where you can get healed right it's very common in the history of religion that this happens um yeah objects you know a certain object is like oh it's like it's cursed it brings you bad luck and uh and if you want to curse somebody you do some magic over this object and maybe bury it you know in their backyard to curse their crops or or their house or or you know that person you know put it in their clothing or who knows what and and it's got like oh really bad energy of cursing and it's very common a, a shaman will also though have healing tools objects that will have healing powers uh he'll have a special magic stick that he'll use or a medicine bag and and in it will have healing kind of energies and powers that he will use for healing purpose he or she so objects uh like this are common places are common and of course people you know with some people you can just feel whew, a really bad vibe you just cringe you want to get away from them and other people are attracting. It just feels so good to be in their presence, all right? It's like there's a good energy about them. You feel like a blessing coming from them, uh, a loving energy. You just, mm, you want to be in their presence. And it often seems that even magical things can happen in their presence. Yeah? So this is the stuff, okay, of religion, these kinds of forces and energies. But again, they are non-physical. We can feel them and sense them, but not necessarily see them. Okay, so then there are also people experience trans empirical beings, intelligences of a non material nature. I like to call them personas because they can take on various shapes and forms and, and throughout history and different cultures of various names. Okay, but people have encounters with beings and in some form of intelligence of a non material nature that can maybe appear in a vision in your mind, in your imagination, where you'll just get a vision and you might even get messages. It could be just telepathic where you just get this imprinted sense of a message of some kind. Sometimes you'll blatantly hear words and you might not even see anything, but you could just hear all of a sudden words are being spoken to you, right? Uh, so you'll get these kinds of encounters, internal vision, or external sometimes literally a being could show up in front of you and you see it as though like you're really seeing something and other people might be seeing it too so you know you're not crazy this sort of stuff happens okay this sort of stuff happens so so you'll have these sorts of experiences of encountering beings right often receiving communications sometimes not but you know sometimes you do sometimes you don't uh for guidance healing protection harm whatever there's an encounter with these beings and so throughout history <clears throat> Uh, we've got all kinds of beings, uh, various names and, and, and levels and degrees, if you like, from uh, in ancient shamanism, your power animals or spirit animals, right? They were sort of the key, key type of beings that people originally seemed to encounter were animals who, who literally had an intelligence about them, certain characteristic features about them. Uh, they would bring about protection they would guide you, heal you, empower you. They would bring their medicine. They'd have a special medicine uh, that could be used, and, and shamans would work with them. They would be their helpers in bringing healing and guidance to the community. Right? It's very common. Then people encounter, of course, spirits of the dead, ghosts, dead ancestors, you know, would appear or they'd see them. Uh, this is very common. Spirits of all kinds, you know, uh, evil ones, good ones, you know, we should call them demons and angels. But the idea that there exists both good and evil spirits is universal all over the world. People encounter and claim they experience these things of both good and bad spirits. 
And then of course, you've got, again, a variety of forms that reflect cultural context. Uh, nature spirits is very common. Certain spirits associated more like say maybe with a tree or with plants or uh, maybe with a particular body of water or a place like a mountain or a hill uh, tied in with nature, sometimes even with fire or with the air. Uh, these often are called nature spirits of various kinds. Then you'll have elves and fairies, for example, little, little beings of various kinds of people. I tell you, they claim the encounter and there's a lot of traditions around these things. The jinn, which is a Muslim thing, uh, the genie that comes out of Aladdin's lamp is a type of spirit. Uh, in China, you have the, the, the hungry ghosts, uh, evil spirits, Taoist immortals that will show up. Um, so you'll have them in all kinds of uh, shapes and sizes throughout the world. But also what's very universal is a belief in spirit guides or guardians. And that's where the power animal was. Everybody would have their power animal. That was sort of their particular guardian spirit that later then sometimes there was sort of like a guardian angel to a type of deity. Um, it goes on, okay? How that plays out in terms of history, different cultures. And then from there, these beings or intelligence, there seems to be a higher level of them in some way that then become known as deities, as gods and goddesses. Okay. And then eventually from that evolves and develops the idea there's one supreme God, the creator God, the source of all that is. Uh, that sometimes the many gods and goddesses are just different names and forms of the one supreme God is an idea that we'll see this in Hinduism. Uh, it's a quite a common idea that you'll get. Okay, so you'll have again a variety of deities. And what's interesting is that in our culture today, <clears throat> people claim to encounter extraterrestrials, you know, and beings from another dimension, from other planets, reptilian beings and whatnot. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, you'll encounter that. And what's interesting <clears throat> is that the, on an experiential level, what's happening for people today, the phenomena it was very similar to what's happened to other people across time and in different cultures. But it takes on sort of the, the science fiction kind of idea of beings on other planets like Star Wars and Star Trek. And you can travel to these other galaxies and encounter other kinds of you know, beings. That, that kind of um, framework is has taken the place of traditional religious framework, but yet experientially, what people experience is very similar to what people experienced in the past. That beings, if it be the elves and fairies or the jinn or the Taoist immortals, what have you, they can take you on a journey to their world. <laughs> Excuse me, to their magical mountains or magical islands or their places under the earth, you know, or they have their own other realms. They take you to these other places and you will meet them and you'll meet their their kinship, you know, their kinfolk, their other elves and fairies and what have you. And that there's a possibility to um, partner with them and actually get married and, and have sex and actually have their babies. Uh, you'll read, and I have read, uh, instances of that in all these different cultures over in ancient China with Taoist immortals, over in Morocco in terms of the jinn of Islam, right? And then you go the fairy tradition in, in medieval Europe. And then today you pick up the National Acquire and there it is, oh, UFO babies. Somebody went on a spaceship and encountered, a, you know, an extra terrestrial somewhere and got impregnated and is now carrying their UFO baby supposedly you know so you'll have these sorts of stories and it's so interesting how they exist across different cultures right so I find that quite fascinating Anyway, to continue on, trans-empirical places. People have experiences, I even already intimated, of journeying to other places, other worlds. And going back into ancient shamanism, which is sort of the origins and the very beginnings of religion is shamanism. It's, you know, the base universal uh, religion is shamanism, where through going into an altered state of consciousness through drumming, okay, or dance, or the use of a plant substance, you go into an altered state. So you're shifting your consciousness. And then you can go into a journey where you journey into either the upper world, which later evolves into heaven, generally speaking, or the lower world, which 
again, long time, way down the road, it seems to evolve into like hellish kind of ideas. It is quite a long evolution for that to come about, okay? And then the middle world, which is this world. And to travel in this world is equivalent to astral traveling, where the shaman would be able to have his soul leave his body and journey in this world, but transcend the usual physical limitation of the body would be able to leave the body and maybe search for where he could hunt the caribou, where the village could find, you know, the, 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 some animals for food. And maybe go over the mountain pass and see, aha, that's where the herd of caribou are, over here, not over there. And then they'll know where to go and do their hunt. Um, so he'll journey to the upper world, the lower world, the middle world for guidance and information, okay? Uh, and also for healing bringing healing medicine to the people, um, healing them in various ways. There's like soul retrieval uh, is a common practice. Anyway, it's all a long story. I don't want to talk about shamanism right now, but there's many things that they would do as they journey to these other worlds. And it's all to serve and meet the needs of the people. But from here though, we'll have this throughout history, people describing their journey through the heavens, uh, their journey into other realms. Okay. And so, excuse me, from these experiences, we then get all kinds of beliefs that develop, beliefs about heaven and hells and, and other places, purgatory and what have you. And so as you can see here, that on the bottom right is a painting uh, from the Muslim world and the Persian, excuse me, Persian painting of Muhammad there is riding on a mythological creature and there's a journey of how he journeyed through the several several uh, layers of the heavens and these other dimensions and here is a vision of a hellish realm where these women are being burned because they did not have their hair totally covered under a burqa okay and that's sort of what that painting's about but so this is where the, again the beliefs evolve over time and it's rooted in people having experiences of journeying to these other dimensions Okay, so <clears throat> the last piece on this part <clears throat> is that there also exist trans-empirical or non-ordinary states of being. Let's go and see if I can move my picture over here. And certain individuals in the history of religion have been able to attain extraordinary states of being that sets them apart in a unique way, where they develop superpowers and they can overcome the usual physical, mental, emotional restrictions and limitations that we humans have in our everyday experience. And it's as though they can transcend physicality by healing those who are sick, okay? Seeing into the future to know what's going to happen, being able to read your mind, to know, ah, oh, this is what you did last week. <laughs> or hearing a conversation taking place miles away that's actually impossible in a physical level. Right? But ha having knowledge of things and, and, and capacity to transcend our usual physical limitations. Right? This is where paranormal phenomena come in or extrasensory perception. You know, having these psychic abilities and gifts to know things that really aren't possible to know, but also to heal and do miracles, to levitate, walk on water, stop a storm, okay, uh, do amazing, miraculous things. It's like you've gained these superpowers. And what these miracles all are, they are the overcoming of physical limitations, okay? And I like to call them, yeah, using modern language, quantum warriors. <laughs> uh, they're able to tap into quantum physics and reality there to shift reality, you know, through the power of consciousness. It seems to be what's going on here, many would say. But this is what we find in the history of religion, people acquiring these superpowers. So to transcend physicality in that way, but also, as I was mentioning earlier, emotional and mental uh, limitations that we have because what do we humans we struggle with we struggle with fear anger hatred jealousy greed you know we have all these negative things getting depressed being just negative whatever right we have we struggle emotionally and mentally with all kinds of things whereas some people attain this higher state they become these holy saints of beings of such purity where they are at peace and they are in bliss. They have no fear. They have no. They don't seek revenge. They do not hate. 
they only say, forgive them. For they, like Jesus, being nailed on the cross, being crucified, the nails going through, the wrists and the feet, and saying, forgive them, for they don't understand what they do. Do you think you could do that? <laughs> That's extraordinary to be able to do that. After somebody has tortured you, whipped you, you know, with, with nails on the whip and whipping you and then nailing you on the cross, leaving you to die so the vultures would come and eat the flesh off of you while you died painfully over days because that was what was involved. And then just to say, oh, Father, I pray that you forgive these people for they don't understand what they're doing. Wow, that's extraordinary, right? So throughout history, there are people who attain this higher state of being that is extraordinary. And they become the enlightened ones, the holy ones. They often become the founders of religions in various ways, you know, like a Jesus and a Buddha and, and various figures like that. And so they become inspirations, role models of what might be possible for us, the rest of us humans. And so this leads us now to the purpose of religion. If this is the essence of religions, is people having these experiences, what, what does it show us? What is the message that's being communicated here? Okay, so let me move this over here. These experiences have huge implications, right? They basically set up and show for us uh, and establish, put in place sort of a dichotomy in human experience. That basically, on the one hand, there is this lower level of reality, a lower level of reality that's very limited. And that's what we call this physical human experience. It has its limitations. It's a type of reality where we experience suffering and pain and struggle and hardship. We get wounded and broken and discouraged and disillusioned. We experience ourselves as being almost powerless, ignorant, lost. Okay, and we get overtaken by the difficulties of life. We can be crushed by it in terms of things that can happen, right? Life is hard and it's a struggle. That's, that's, and then and we have to always deal with oh, trying to not hate, uh, trying to deal with suffering, deal with evil, deal with our own inner demons, right? So there's that aspect of life and reality of our struggles and the hardship and its limitations. But then, through the history of religion, what does it also show? It shows, well, there's a whole nother level of reality. There's a whole nother dimension. There's a whole nother possibility for us. That there is a higher reality. A higher reality where this higher intelligences abide. That can know all things. There is also a higher dimension possible that has superpowers <laughs> that maybe we could tap into in some way and access in some way and have these superpowers bring healing to us, bring empowerment to us, raise us up literally from the dead to do miracles, that that is possible, that there is this higher reality. Okay. And that, so here, as I say, the reality where we can experience healing and protection, being empowered, attaining enlightenment, being wise, knowing that through this, we can get guidance and insight to know what to do when. To like, no, it's not good to go on that road trip tomorrow because it would be dangerous. I'm not getting into that plane or I'm making that flight because I know it's going to crash or whatever. You know, and those intuition hits that you might get for things, right? Is that inner knowing. And so all this in terms of power to heal, to protect, to guide, to strengthen, to raise you up, and ultimately bring you into this higher state of being to become holy and, and like a saint and, and attain these superpowers, that that might be possible. All so that we then can live here and be victorious and have success, right? So there's this dichotomy that's set up in terms of reality and human experience that we're down here and we want that. And so what's going to happen is humans are going to want to access that higher reality and tap into it for power, tap into it for strength, for healing, for guidance. And this is what's going to shape then the purpose of religion that a lot of religions have lost. Okay, They've lost that original essence behind religion, the purpose of it, because they've gotten so caught up in the beliefs that they develop and all the doctrines that they develop and the rituals that they develop that they've lost sight of what the original purpose of all this was for. 
Let me just have a little sip here. And so, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to move this down here. I guess I don't know. I don't. All right. So, uh, in the history of religion, in an academic sense, uh, they always talk about the sacred and the mundane. And, and this is where they're intimating of this dichotomy, but I'm really highlighting more so in my way, the differences here. But so people throughout time, they've experienced these two realities, the lower one of limitation and struggle, and then this higher one of freedom and well-beingness, okay? That can just whew, raise us up, that there's that kind of division. That which is sacred and that which is profane, the sacred or the mundane, the holy and the unholy this world and the other world. And so what happens is that religion will set up, um, uh, and, and this is where it, how it gets institutionalized, that for to connect with the holy, that there usually then is a process of purification, of leaving behind the unholy as you're leaving this physical world with its contaminations, and you're going into a holy place, for example. So here I have just a picture of the Torii, which is, excuse me, I shouldn't have do this after eating supper. <laughs> That's sort of the gate, that when you go through this gate, you are now in a holy area. This is holy ground, a holy space, okay? And so you come in reverentially. And a lot of ancient holy places were set up this way, where there was sort of, you know, a boundary in place that marked you know, the outer world of the mundane, the profane of, of this physical world with its contamination, and then the holy place inside. And there was a boundary that as you enter in, you know, then there'd often be rituals of purification involved often. And then you come into the most holy of holies where the shrine is or the altar in some way. That is the most holy place. That is where, oh, this is like a portal that connects this world to the other world of the sacred, the holy, the spiritual. And that's usually how most temples and holy places are set up this way, is in terms of this kind of di dichotomy. And so here again is a picture, let's say, for example, in the church. You know, you've got the building that is holy, but what's most holy is what takes place up there at the altar, okay? And that's the holy of holies. The Jewish temple literally would call it the holy of holies that's in the holy place that's within the larger boundary grounds of a temple. It's very common that you have those kind of stages, right? Okay, so, so then, so what is the goal of religion? It is for us then to connect with the holy, connect with the sacred, connect with the spiritual. What? So that it, through that connection, it brings healing, it brings guidance, and will help us in this life to be more successful, to be re empowered and strengthened. Uh, it, it meets all those sorts of needs, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and even physical needs. Okay? It's meant to meet our needs. So religion is to serve the people instead of the people always serving the religion. Okay, it's the religion is there as a structure that's meant to nurture and help you to have the spiritual connection working for you. Okay, so you can get the benefits of the religion, right? It's meant to be beneficial for you. Yeah, that's what it's meant to be. I'm uh, not saying that's usually what happens, but that's what's supposed to happen. So, uh, so religion then is the means through which we as a people engage and participate with these trans-empirical realities, the sacred, the spiritual, okay? And that connection going on here serves two purposes. One, to have a successful life here and now, okay? That I will be protected from harm, protected from evil, protected from bad things happening. You, that's why a lot of people pray, oh God, protect me, help me, save me, <laughs> right? They pray for protection. And then to be guided, Please show me what to do. Should I go this way or that way? Should I do this or do that? Guidance, okay? Protection, guidance. And then healing. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I'm feeling weak. I need strength. I need help. Healing, right? And then to prosper. Please make this successful. I ask for your blessing upon this. Bless it. May it be successful. May my business go well. May I study well at school and get a good grade, <laughs> okay? May I be a good mother. May I have a nice house, you know, is praying for being prospered and blessed, okay? So these are the things that we seek. Uh, then secondly, 
okay, this connection, the spiritual connection, the purpose of it is that through that connection, we undergo a transformation. There is a journey that we are supposed to be on, a journey where I purify myself of the lower qualities, uh, the lower uh, characteristics, where I maybe would be under the influences of fear and greed and lust and pride and anger and hatred and jealousy and all those negative things. Right, but that I would increasingly have those be removed and be purified from them, and instead they get replaced with being loving and forgiving, compassionate, generous, uh, uh, at peace, courageous you know, various things like that. And so, that through that transformation, I then can discover and tap into the potential of who I can all be as a human being. And that potential is actually a spiritual one. The spiritual self, the soul, these higher qualities within the human being have been generally held to be spiritual qualities. A very holy person is a spiritual person that embodies these higher characteristics and qualities of what an ideal person would be, of being very loving and generous and kind, but also so it also has its own special kind of power because you're attracted to someone like that and they exude confidence because they have no fear. They're confident because they're so totally at peace. They're in joy. They have a, in a state of joy, no matter what you can't phase them. They stay solid and strong no matter what. And so it's about a transformation that's meant to happen that we then come into this higher state of being, a higher self, okay? And uh, that is more a spiritual self. And that is sort of the spiritual journey, okay? To awaken that, because that possibility, that potential is there within every single human being. You know, and we, we, can, we can go either way. <laughs> you know, we can become demons or angels. And it all depends as to which one of the, do we feed. You know, there's like, you've probably heard the, uh, it's an indigenous kind of saying amongst the elders that we all have two wolves, a bad one and a good one, and or a black one and a white one. And, and they're always fighting each other or at war with each other. And it's up to us which one we feed is the one that's going to win. Okay. As they're basically, it's a battle for our soul. And that kind of story will show up all over the place in terms of the gut you know, a spirit on each shoulder, a good one and a bad one. One can be, no, you don't want to do that. You want to be terrible. You want to be jealous and you want revenge. You want to hate them, hate them. And the other one saying, no, you should love them and forgive them. <laughs> right? And so we're caught in this battle between good and evil. That's a whole human journey. What do we do with the choices that we make in life? Do we choose good over evil? What do we choose? To be conscious of our choices is the key. And it's a journey. This is the spiritual journey that we're on. And so then, in a nutshell, <clears throat> across time, people have looked to religion for guidance, to get information from this higher source of intelligence, and also to access, access these greater powers for healing and empowerment. All right? And these were always the key functions of the shaman where religion, magic, spirituality, these all were seen as essential for success in life. And so this is the thing, is religion, i.e. or spirituality, it is there meant to bring you greater success in life, to have a better life, the best of life, that you become the best that you could be as a person. That's the whole point of it, okay? That's the purpose and goal of religion. So from these essential experiences, again, going back to just what is religion, you know, it's this sort of universal essential experiences, like all across the world, people have these experiences. From that, people then develop belief systems, beliefs about who are these trans-empirical beings, 
Uh, are they God spirits? What kind of spirits? What kind of gods? Right? We develop beliefs about the gods. We develop beliefs about well, what is the self? Do we have a soul? One soul? Many soul? What happens to the soul when you die? Uh, you know, all kinds of beliefs develop about that, about the afterlife, how we should live, what's right, what's wrong, what will please the gods, be in harmony with the will of the gods, uh, to have them support you and protect you from harm. You know, all religions are just belief system. So they flesh out from these experiences, they then develop all these beliefs and practices. Okay? And then over time, these beliefs and practices, as they evolve, they become institutionalized and organized into particular religions. Okay? Uh, and so uh, what the different religions are is basically the packaging of various beliefs and practices into a system that then also reflects that given historical and cultural context. So these kinds of experiences over in China will develop particular beliefs and practices over in China into the different religions there with mean, some aspects of Taoism, Confucianism, etc. Right? As opposed to over in India with Hinduism, maybe Jainism, Buddhism, how they all develop and Sikhism. Uh, then over in the Middle East and Judaism, Christianity, Islam, how that all develops, right? They'll all have different cultural context, different time period in history, so that that religion is responding to that history. So for example, Sikhism responding to, oh, there's Hinduism here, Islam over there. Boy, what are we going to do here? <laughs> how can we stop the fighting between these religions? They're so different. They're so different, right? And so Sikhism is, in a sense, a response to that context, that situation in India in the 1500s, basically, or 14 to 1500s, okay? So, so this is all how then the religions evolve over time. And then we have different religions. So let's take a look a bit more at the structure of religion. Okay, hopefully all this makes sense. I'm losing my voice now. <clears throat> Now, this is a key thing, is religion is dealing with these trans-empirical realities, right? I don't know, can you, oh, my back is getting sore. Um, how, do we, how do we talk about realities that are non-physical in nature, that are non-material? How do we go about talking about these? How do we describe them if they're not concrete and physical and tangible? Well, what happens is that religion then has to use a lot of symbolism to communicate uh, and, and to try to describe these non-physical realities. They use symbols, okay? And that's going to show up through the use of myth and ritual. And I need to unpack this all a bit. So what is myth? Okay, because if you, if you do any kind of studying down the road in terms of religious studies in an academic way, you're going to talk about myth and ritual. <laughs> okay, they're always seen as quite central to, to, to religion. Excuse me. So what myth is? Technically, excuse me, a myth is simply a particular form of literary genre. It's just a certain type of literature. Okay? It doesn't mean, oh, it's a lie or it's a falsehood. That's a excuse me, very popular use of the term today that really is, does not at all represent how myth is used in academia. In academic circles, it technically it refers to a particular type of literature. And it's a type of literature okay, that has stories, that is in story form, and they're stories generally about the gods, stories about spiritual realities. And in these stories, they use a lot of symbolism. And so... They, need, they use symbolism has the potential for a symbol has the potential to carry various levels and, and deeper levels of meaning than just a sign. So, for example, I don't know, you know, a stop sign. You know, you have the sign of the stop. What does a stop sign mean? Well, it just simply means one thing that you're supposed to stop there when you're driving your car or riding your bike or whatever. It, it has no extra levels of meaning is not a symbol for something. When something becomes a symbol, like the cross, the sign of a cross, say in Christianity, for example, you know, it's like, wow, you could write books as to what that could all mean, because it's loaded with levels and layers of meaning, and it could be interpreted in many ways. So it's very rich, 
Okay, um, so that's one thing about a symbol is, is that depth and, 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 and um, diversity of interpretation and levels of meaning. And so, for example, we have, and I always like telling this story because it's such a good one, in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, the very first book in the Bible that talks about the creation of the world and of the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. Adam simply means man. Eve simply means woman in Hebrew and how they're first created. And they are created and they're living in the Garden of Eden, this paradise. And in the Garden of Eden, it's very simply described that they're there and they don't have to work. They do not die. They're immortal beings. They'll live forever. Uh, there's no suffering, no evil, it's pure bliss, and they can just pick the fruit from the trees and eat it. They don't have to worry about getting food. And every night, God comes down and hangs out with them and talks with them every evening. They hang out literally with God every evening in the garden, okay? And they're naked, just free to be in the Garden of Eden, okay? Well, here they are in this garden, and there's all these different trees, and God says, yes, you can eat of all these trees, but do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what kind of tree is that? Huh? Is that meant to, are you, are you meant to take this literally? That there literally is this tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No, it's symbolism. Well, then what happens next is a snake comes along, and the snake comes along and comes slithering along, comes up to Eve and talks to her. It's just like a Harry Potter snake and says, oh, Eve, did God say you shouldn't eat the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil? And she's like, yeah, yeah. Do you know why? He says, no, I don't know why. She says, ah, oh, I can tell you why. <clears throat> because if you eat the fruit of this tree, you shall become like God. Wow, if I eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I shall become like God. Ooh. Wow, that's a loaded one. That is a loaded one. So I should stop sharing it because I'm talking so much here. What on earth is this tree all about? That if I eat of it, I shall become like God. Mm. So Eve is eating this, and then Adam comes along and says, oh, give me some. And so Adam gets some, and he eats some, and they're both eating this, this fruit. And all of a sudden, they look at each other. It's like, ah! And they want to cover their bodies and hide in shame. Well, what happened? What happened? Why are they now ashamed of each other? Then the next thing that happens is evening. And God comes down, as he does every evening. And it's like, hey, Adam and Eve, where are you guys? Adam, where are you? And they're hiding in the bushes. And God, being smart, figures it out. Ah, Adam, have you eaten the fruit of that tree? And Adam pipes up and goes, yes, I have. The woman that you created, she made me do it. So here you get the blame game, right? He blames first Eve for making him eat it. And then he blames God because God made Eve. And so it's not his fault, okay? So it's ultimately God's fault that he ate this fruit of this tree. And so then what happens is they are then kicked out of this garden. And they, A, now have to work hard to get their food. They'll grow, try to grow food, and weeds and thistles grow. And it's a struggle just to grow food. It's a battle with nature to survive. And then now, with man and woman, they were ashamed of their nakedness. They now have to cover themselves. And now there's going to be conflict and struggle in human relationships. They're no longer free just to be who they are with each other. They now have to hide in shame and suspicion and struggle in their relationship. So something happened in human to human relationship, human to nature, human to human. And then God, oof, God is gone. God no longer hangs out with them every evening. God is now difficult to find. There has to be a quest, a search for God. God will reveal, but also hides. There's the hiddenness of God and the revelation of God. You have that dance going on. And so things have changed. And of all things, they now experience death. And they experience suffering. They are now literally on a path that is the knowledge of good and evil from eating the fruit of that tree. So now I've elaborated here. That story in, the, in Genesis, in the Bible there, is very short. It's just a couple of paragraphs. And kaboom! 
right there in this little story through the use of symbolism. It's trying to convey big truths about life, about the human existence, the human journey, the human dilemma, about why we suffer and struggle with nature just to work and survive, with people in relationships, in our search for God, and above all, why we suffer and we die. Because since they lost their immortality, death now came to humanity. Okay? And that this is the journey. Uh, this is the quest that we are on. So anyways, getting off on track here, but this is the nature of myth, is it puts in story form through the use of symbolism, trying to convey the big truths about life, okay, uh, about reality. Whoops, and I want to go back to sharing the screen. I went the wrong way. I, I needed to. How did I? Uh, let me just share screen. Okay, that one. Okay, okay, there we go. So, so symbolism, as I say here, they bring us the big truths about life. They provide the maps, a map of reality, describing what is, describing that, yep, there is suffering, there's death, this is how it came about, this is what happened, right, for example. And then also maps for reality, and this is key, prescriptive, prescribing what ought to be, giving us a vision, a hope of what's meant to be. What's meant to be is we're meant to be living in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> we're meant to be living in bliss, in peace, in harmony, in harmony with nature, harmony in human relationships, harmony with God, okay? All those key uh, uh, categories of being, self, nature, and God, all right? They're the three fundamental categories of being uh, that, that's all meant to be in harmony, okay? A harmonious relationship. That is what ought to be. That is what we need to seek for, okay? So it describes what is, i.e., that lower level of reality, the mess that we're in, that we suffer, we struggle, we have hardships, uh, we've got problems, we're limited, and yet also it shows what could be, a vision, a vision of what's possible for us, a possible destiny, the utopia we long for. We all long for seeing the kingdom of heaven on earth, uh, attaining nirvana, <laughs> all right? That quest, that desire, that longing, it's like it's meant to be. We are on a journey to get there, okay? That's the message. That's the message. So, so religion tries to communicate that to us, okay, in various ways. Some do it better than others, all right? I have to say that. It's not like they're all equal either, okay? Um, but this is the thing. This is what gets, comes through in, in a lot of the stories that they have, okay, and, and the traditions and, and the teachings. And then these would be put in a lot of the holy books, okay? So that's one role of symbolism where it gets used as a myth. The second role of symbolism shows up is in ritual. And so all religions have rituals, the use of rituals. So these are practices, okay, physical practices, gestures that symbolize spiritual realities, okay? And that through then rituals, through these symbolic gestures, physical things that we do, uh, that they then help us relate to non-physical realities, the spiritual or trans-empirical realities, okay, through ritual. Now, let me see. I can't remember what the next slide is, why my voice is going. Okay, let me kind of um, go back here because this is, um, how do I go back? Okay, here, yeah. So for example, here you see somebody praying. Prayer, you know, it's universal. Prayer is a ritual. On all religions, there's this thing called prayer. Everywhere, everywhere, okay? And what do they do? Okay, you can tell this guy's praying. He's got his hands up. And that's very common in prayer, doing your hands like this, like this, like this, on your knees, standing up, holding them up, whatever. You can usually tell when somebody is, quote, praying. These are physical gestures. These physical gestures are symbols. They symbolize what I'm doing spiritually, okay, that I'm trying to connect with this spiritual reality through this gesture, right? Um, 
And so all religions will have rituals of various kinds. They'll use objects uh, in their rituals. You know, what's classic example would be in Christianity, the Eucharist or Mass, you know, where you've got a piece of bread and some wine that symbolizes the body and blood of Christ, right? And that as I eat and partake of that, I am then communion. I am becoming one with Christ through this. So this is how I'm becoming one with God is by partaking in this ritual, okay? And so physical things are have symbolic meaning. So this is one thing we find throughout religion is the use of rituals, that we need to do this because we're relating, trying to relate to non-physical reality. So we need to use symbolism, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so now how does this all come together here in terms of the structure of religion? This is rather long. I probably should have broken this up. I didn't think I'd be talking so long. Whew, and my voice is starting to go because it's my third round of a recording with other classes. Um, so anyways, the way I look at religion is like this. You have the outer sphere, as you can see here, hopefully. That's all good. You have the outer sphere, which is uh, the religion that exists as an organization or institution. This is sort of the objective component. When you think of out there, this is the religion. Okay, and it's got different key components to it, right? And I'll get to those in a sec. Then you have the inner sphere, right? The inner sphere, this is the subjective component, i.e. the experience of the individual that's participating in that religion. I as a subject, as a participant in the object of a religion. And so that is like what I experience in that religion, what it means to me, okay, how I relate to it, what it does for me as an individual on a personal level. And that's what we could call spirituality. So an individual, this is their spirituality. Uh, they use that religion to nurture their spirituality. It nurtures their experience of that, that, you know, as they experience things about that religion, it's meant to be nurturing to them on a spiritual level, okay? So that's how they engage it and participate in it. So, so a religion as an organization, it has the three key components. First of all, as you can see here to the lower right, it is a social institutional organization, right? That usually has a building, like various holy places, temples. They have their leaders. The leaders are responsible for running that religious organization. Okay, and it could be, you know, the leader of this temple or that church, or the priest and what have you. And then maybe they account to higher ups and it's a hierarchy of leadership and whatnot. But you've got the organization with the buildings and the leaders. Okay, then in those buildings with those leaders, you go there to receive the teachings in that church and to engage in the rituals that would the practices that would be done in that church or temple or whatever it is. Okay. So there's always then the, the theoretical component of beliefs and then the practical component to the practices and rituals, uh, maybe rules and laws that you would follow, ethical precepts and guidelines, what you can do and can't do. Okay. So that's the practical side. All right. And so in terms of the belief side, you will have some of these myths, these stories and traditions. There'll be the teachings of the founder, the teachings of the Buddha, the teachings of Jesus, revelations believed to come from Allah in terms of Quran or what have you, the various traditions, okay? There'll be various teachings and, and, and uh, texts involved, and often they'll first be memorized in an oral form, and then eventually they get written down into written texts, okay? So then what happens is that in those texts and, and teachings and traditions, as you can see here on the upper right, a lot of the teachings and, and what's written there, the meaning could be implied, is implicit, perhaps even ambiguous. But the leaders then will spell out what is the proper interpretation. They will spell out and make explicit what the meaning is. That, ah, the teaching here, what does it, this is what it means. They will spell it out for you and make it clear. Okay, what the teachings are, like I talked about the Garden of Eden story. Uh, the leader would say, well, this is what it means. This is how to interpret the text. And from that, what they make explicit, explicit in terms of beliefs and, and meaning, they then will systemize that into turn it, 
systematize the, these beliefs into the form of doctrines, okay, into a form of doctrines. And, uh, and this is where then the leaders take a key role in telling you and explaining to you and interpreting uh, what those texts and traditions all mean, and they'll put them into a collection of defined doctrines for you. That if you're going to be a part of this religion, you're to believe A, B, C, D. Okay. Then secondly, the key thing what the leaders do is they then go through the texts and all these traditions, and they sort them through, right, sort through them, and then turn some of them into authoritative texts. They say, well, from all these books, ta-da, this is going to become our scripture. This is going to have the highest authority for the faith. These books we regard as revealed, as inspired. They have the true words of the Buddha or Jesus or what have you. This is the authentic Quran. Uh, it is the leaders who create the scriptures. They don't just drop out of the sky. They are created by the leaders in any religion. Okay, They will kind of sort this through and they'll decide one way or another that this is what's going to be included in the holy book, okay? And then maybe other books that are very important, very holy, but not of equal status to the main holy book. So you'll have things like the Hadith or the Talmud, uh, you, know, you know, various things like that, all right, that are second in um, authority, okay? So, so all religions then will have a... They have their doctrines, a system of doctrines, beliefs that the leaders have defined for the people, that this is what you must believe if you're going to be a part of this religion. This is what's expected for you to believe. Then they all will have their holy books, scriptures. And it's, most people don't think about it, but have you ever wondered why is it that all religions have their holy books? <laughs> okay. They all do. They've got a certain, a certain kind of compilation of texts that has an elevated status that is given ultimate authority to say, here is the truth of our religion. This is what we must believe is in this book. It is given the ultimate authority for defining our faith. And why does it have that authority? Because we believe it is inspired. It has the direct revelation from God. It's inspired by God. Uh, it's coming from a higher source in some way. This book is not just mere human opinion. It is of a higher source. Okay, that's a key thing. And so that's the foundation are those texts. But again, the leaders play a key role in setting all up the whole structure of religion. Okay, so, so you'll have then um, here, I'll go to leadership. There are basically two types of leadership qualification. Uh, either you become a religious spiritual leader and what qualifies you to be a leader is because whoo, you've had the direct experience. You've literally heard the words of God. You know, you're like a prophet type figure. Or you've become enlightened and you're the enlightened guru and you know the truth about reality and all that is. Or you're a shaman that has made, like, again, the shaman made that journey. The thing is, is ancient shamanic cultures, they were in societies where there was no writing. So none of that stuff got written down, but they have their stories, their traditions that they passed on, okay? But that allowed it to be more flexible. As soon as we develop civilizations with the development of writing, shamanism as a religion did not function in those societies. We can't be established where religions developing in civilizations where there's development of writing. And that's when things got frozen into texts and then with it frozen leaders in the terms of institutional appointment. You become a religious leader because you're appointed by the organization that, yes, you're officially a Hindu priest, a Brahmin priest, or, you know, a, a rabbi or a priest or what have you, okay? Uh, that develops later on. Early period, before the development of writing and, and civilizations as such, the shaman was just someone who had the gift for being able to go in an altered state and journey to the world of the spirits and get that. They had that special gift, right? And then from there it evolves. And uh, we, once we get development of writing, we then get organized religion more. And with it, we get the role of leaders who are leaders by appointment. Okay. 
uh, and they're quite different. So they have an authority, spiritual, religious authority, but it's an authority that is given to them by an institution that says, yes, we approve. <laughs> you know, you have been ordained, you've uh, gone through the schooling and the training, and you know, you haven't created any scandals, and so now you're qualified to be a leader. Okay, uh, so this is sort of what happens here in terms of leadership. You have the two basic types. Okay, and then there's an evolution of all of that in the terms of the history of religion. Okay, and so uh, last point I want to make here, I think my last point or maybe second last, is that spiritual realities involve spiritual ways of knowing and the use of altered states of consciousness is prevalent. Okay, in the ancient world, in you know before the development of writing especially so uh the use of altered states was the norm uh in terms of spiritual religious traditions and uh, where the shaman would go in an altered state in order to journey to the world of the gods as soon as we have writing that develops and we have the holy books in place then people think well why should i go in an altar state and get the words from god directly i'll just read the holy book because the words are already written down so there's no need for that direct content we already have the words in a book and so that then starts shriveling up uh, once we get the religions that evolve okay so this is what happens and yeah so that's why then often these sorts of alternative ways of knowing through an altered state of consciousness can be held in suspicion sometimes by traditional religion it's like no 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 you don't need to do that we've got ta-da the answer already here in the book and there's pros and cons to everything okay i mean yeah the, 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 again there's a whole big story about every religion everything but but just to be aware that this is an issue and so again to highlight another aspect of this is that epistemology always correlates with metaphysics. What I mean by that is that in terms of, and this is a big issue between science and religion, if you are assuming in terms of your metaphysics, i.e. your view of the nature of reality, if you believe that reality is strictly physical, material in nature, this empirical world of the five senses, then your ways of knowing that reality, your epistemology, will be limited to empirical observation through the five senses. And that's what science is all about, empirical observation, right, and rational analysis. Uh, and so that's a scientific method. And so, yes, science is very well suited as a way of knowing for this physical material world. But what has always been the case in religion is that we're dealing with a different subject matter <laughs> we're dealing with a different type of reality not a physical reality of the five senses but a whole other dimension of reality that's non-physical therefore we need other ways of knowing and that's why in the history of religion uh they have disciplines and and methods of how to nurture an other way of knowing through you know the use of altered states in terms of some of these plant substances uh, drumming, fasting, isolation, meditation, prayer. These were all the methods that they would use, for example, in terms of knowing, getting to know the spiritual realm, okay, uh, spiritual realities. It's a different method of knowing. So that's just something to be aware of, okay? All right. Okay, I'm, I'm getting running down here. I should have broken this up into two sections or something one last little thing i think this is oh, i don't know if it's the last one anyways i better quit saying that one more thing i want to say here is how a religion works is like this you will have an individual in the center here an individual who is seeking god seeking experiences seeking the spiritual seeking very much connecting with this higher reality and that excuse me, individual have whew, profound experiences, transformational experiences, becomes enlightened, really breaks through. And from those experiences, people will see like, wow, you know, oh, look at this. Person. They've got superpowers. Oh, they, they're enlightened. They just radiate this light. Uh, they're so at peace. Uh, they've undergone this transformation. Uh, you know, they will attract people to them. Okay. 
And they will quickly now become the founder of a new religion. They will start attracting followers because, whoa, they've got this connection going. They've broken through. They're connected. Okay. And so with that, uh, they then start gathering followers around and they start teaching them about how you too can connect and what this is really all about and how this all works. So the followers will start receiving their teachings and they'll memorize them and it becomes an oral form and eventually they'll write them down. Okay? And then this teacher will also teach them what to do, how to practice, how to pray, how to meditate, right? They'll be teaching them various things, uh, how to live, what's right, what's wrong, the ethics to live by, right? So they're gathering those. Well, then the teacher dies. And so then somebody's going to be appointed as a leader to like, oh, well, let's keep this up. Let's make sure we follow our teacher's ways, right? And, uh, and let's make sure we write everything down. And, and, and this is how you get a religion beginning. Okay, this is how you get a religion beginning. And so then the religion will get established and it'll be in place and you'll have a religion like Judaism or like Hinduism or Jainism or something. And then there'll be an individual in there and they go on a quest and there will be things where they will be in conflict with that religious establishment. And they may challenge some of their beliefs, some of their ideas. And some of the challenging of those ideas and beliefs can lead in one of two ways. Either it'll be so different, they'll be kicked out and they'll have to start a brand new religion. So like with the Buddha, it's like, hey, you Hindus, I cannot buy the authority of the Hindu priests. I cannot accept the authority of the Hindu scriptures. Uh, I found the truth for myself through my meditation and enlightenment. And so it becomes the new religion of Buddhism. Other times, it can become a sect within that religion, a new sect, like Martin Luther and kicking off a Protestant Reformation. So it's a new sect that breaks away from the Catholic Church, but is still Christian, still Christianity, but just critical of what he held was corruption in the Catholic Church at the time, for example. So People will have experiences, challenge that religious establishment, want to make some changes, and they can either be too radical and different, they'll be kicked out and it becomes a new religion, like the Baha'is being kicked out of Islam, for example, right? Or it could become a sect within a religion, all right, like the Shia versus the Sunni in Islam, or Protestant versus Catholics in Christianity, or in Buddhism, Mahayana versus Theravada Buddhism, or Zen, or whatever, okay? They become then sects within that religion, right? And that's how it kind of goes. Uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, religion is always kind of evolving, changing, people breaking away, wanting to make changes. Uh, maybe give birth to a new movement of some kind or be so radically different it's kicked out altogether, right? So it's very dynamic, but it kind of operates along these lines. Whew, I think I'm at the end here. Is this it? Okay, let's, okay, good. I'm just kind of, good. So to wrap up then, uh, what is the universal message that religion conveys? First of all, religion tells us, the message that religion wants to bring to us is that there is something more to reality than meets the eye. That there is indeed a higher spiritual dimension to reality. To reality out the world, out there in the world, and to the self, in terms of myself. There's more to me, <laughs> okay, like a soul and, and the potential for maybe divinity within me. Uh, that's number one. There's something more. Secondly, the message of religion is that there's a cosmic moral order of right and wrong. Okay, it's a cosmic moral law. Uh, and it's an order of right and wrong. And we need to align with it. And there are consequences if we do or don't. So it matters how you live. So in other words, is hell. That's why all religions have ethical precepts that they live by. That there's a right way and a wrong way to live. And so to do well in life, you need to do good and be good in life, okay? And if you do, that means there's a consequence. You'll be rewarded for your goodness. That reward will be either good karma in terms of a future rebirth, or you get to heaven, or you'll be released from this whole sphere altogether. Or if, the consequence, if you're bad, you know, that's bad karma. Or you go to a hellish realm, okay? Uh, there's consequences for how you live so it matters what you do.
The third thing, message of religion, is that indeed we experience suffering, evil, brokenness, weakness, we mess up, ignorance, we're lost, uh, we're fallen, uh, there's death, and we know that this is not what's meant to be, that there's something wrong with planet Earth, there's something wrong with how a lot of us humans live, and we need to change that, we need to strive for utopia, okay, and that then leads to the fourth point, that there's the quest, the belief that this can change, that it's possible to really realize that utopia, that there's a path, a way to our salvation, our liberation, to attain that nirvana, the kingdom of heaven on earth, okay, and religion is there to help us get there, okay, religion can provide the map of it all and the path to realizing that utopia, right, that's the message of religion. And this is basically the same thing, what I just said. I kind of had another slide, so I'll let you just read that up. Okay, my voice is going. So in conclusion, aha, uh -huh, just this is the last statement here. Let me just kind of move this out of the way up here. Religion is rooted in human experience, and it's origin and source is primarily of an experiential nature, <clears throat> an experience of a higher intelligence, a higher power that can bring guidance and healing. And all this then gets translated into doctrines, beliefs, practices, and rituals, becomes institutionalized and objectified. You become this thing we call religion out there. And keep in mind the distinction between the phenomenon of religion the essence of religion, which I would hold it, are these trans-empirical realities on an experiential level. That's sort of the essence. And then how that then gets packaged into the different religions, okay, into institutionalized forms of that essence, okay? But we can kind of almost de-structure, deconstruct those uh, packages to get back at that essence. So different religions are like packages containing aspects of the essence of religion that then is mixed in with historically shaped components and colorings. So religion holds that it's of highest importance for us to be connected with and guided by this higher reality. And consequently, no human society has ever existed without it. Okay. Religion is never going to die away. Uh, it always has been and probably always will be in one way or another. All right. So that's it for this, this module. Okay. All right. Take care.